Ambassador Stoyles Bracker, welcome to Europe Now. Thank you very much for having me. You've just taken up the ambassadorship here. What are your first impressions of Australia? Uh, I have to qualify the answer by saying that I have been visiting Australia over the last 25 years. Uh, I'm married to an Australian, so I feel I know Australia to some extent. Uh, it's my first time to be here as a professional, so I think that changes the perspective. Uh, but it, I feel and I've, I'm confirmed in my sense that Australia is a very easy country to get to know people, to build your network, um, to uh, find your way. Um, it's, it's very similar in many perspectives uh, to the Netherlands. Uh, for me, this is my first Western country. Uh, I feel that the codes are easier to understand than in many other countries where I worked. Um, so all in all, a pretty easy landing. The relationship between the Netherlands and Australia, what should Australians know? What's happening at the moment and what's the likely trajectory that you see? What I think is important to note is that, yes, Australia and the Netherlands have for many, many, many years uh, maintained a very good cordial relationship. And in that sense, there's nothing much going to change. But we feel that given changes in the geopolitical and geoeconomic context, there is a reason, uh, at least from uh, our perspective, to try to even strengthen and maybe um, give a little bit more intensity to the relationship between our two countries. Uh, we feel there are areas where uh, we very much would like to learn from Australia, for instance, in the field of economic uh, security. But we also hope that uh, we can show that we are a relevant uh, partner who in areas um, like the energy transition perhaps could uh, complement uh, things that Australia needs from, from Europe. So I think in many different ways, we can complement one another, um, becoming more resilient in a, in a world that is becoming, uh, for many of us, a little bit more uh, hostile. The Netherlands is the second largest export market for Australia and Europe, um, something that perhaps not all Australians necessarily are aware of. And that's quite extraordinary. Uh, can you tell us a bit more about the um, you know, trading relations between the two countries and how, the, how this has developed and, and where you, that you see the potential for growth? <laughs> What is important to note is that uh, the Netherlands has a very uh, open uh, economy, a very outward looking, uh, open orientation. We are the gateway to Europe with Rotterdam uh, as our uh, harbour, our port. Uh, and it's, I think, to a large extent because of that function uh, as uh, providing an entry point to the rest of Europe that uh, automatically we also receive a lot of uh, exports. So uh, I'm not quite sure when you mentioned this statistic whether what percentage stays in the Netherlands and what percentage is perhaps then further uh, forwarded to uh, uh, Germany or other countries within, within Europe. The port of Rotterdam is an important stakeholder in that regard. We do hope that we can be the gateway to Europe for the import of hydrogen. Uh, I think it's very exciting to see all the developments uh, with regard to hydrogen in Western Australia, in South Australia. Australia. Reason why I used, uh, or not used, why I visited these two states as the first two states um, to be formally introduced to, so so-called state visits, um, to show our interest in engaging in, in economic relations with Australia, with these states, on, on issues like hydrogen, energy transition, critical minerals. Um, so, um, in as far as I can predict what the profile of future exports may be, I think it's, it's in relation to hydrogen critical minerals supply chain. So there's certainly, yes, innovation in hydrogen, but it seems that, you know, um, there's lots of other influences uh, now starting to appear in Australia. I'm thinking of sort of, you know, Dutch design mm. turning up in, for example, the bridge that's gone over the Swan River in, in Perth, um, getting people cycling and, um, you know, lots, lots of other areas which are emerging as well. I couldn't agree more. Uh, we as a country want to be considered be seen as a country that has uh, innovation uh, as, as uh, a trademark, so to speak, um, sustainable solutions. Uh, that's what we hope we can um, 
assist Australia as, as well with. Um, we, we do not necessarily produce a lot, but uh, when it comes to planning, design, um, the way you organize a solution for a problem. Uh, the Netherlands, I guess, is known for its stakeholder consultations, looking for consensus, consensus building. These are areas where we feel we can also show other countries how we've done it, how it has worked for us. Obviously, accepting that uh, the situation in other countries uh, may have certain certain differences, but at least uh, offering uh, a potential way out that could also work for a country like Australia. Ambassador, climate change has been top of the political agenda uh, now for many years. The European Union is committed to carbon neutrality by 2050. Can you tell me something about the Netherlands and what the Netherlands, uh, what actions it is undertaking in order to contribute to this carbon neutrality? Over the last couple of years, I think the Netherlands has accelerated its action towards meeting the goals that we also as, an, as a nation state have committed to and then obviously part of the European Union. Um, I believe the statistic is that uh, both Australia and the Netherlands are now uh, at the ranking at the top positions uh, when it comes up when it comes to take up of solar uh, panels, uh, domestic uh, housing. Um, so that's one way we are trying to go forward um, when it comes to building a new housing estates. We try to stay away from uh, gas, so decoupling of, of gas, which, as you may know, for a very long time was an important uh, source of energy for the Netherlands as we had our own natural gas. Um, issues concerning the emissions produced by the farming sector, which I think is now a challenge that we uh, have in common with uh, Australia, is, is high on the agenda, creating, um, by the way, lots of uh, challenges for the government. The, the farming sector is um, has organized itself and, and uh, is, is uh, feeling singled out when it comes to the burden to uh, wear to bear, the burden to bear, uh, in, in taking care of emission reductions. Uh, but obviously um, other stakeholders in society are um, addressed as well. Mm. Um, mm. Say uh, steel producers, Tata Steel is an important um, uh, actor. Uh, also um, our um, airports, Schiphol. In many different sectors, I think we, we all uh, feel uh, committed, but are also invited to, to bear uh, our responsibility when it comes to, uh, to climate change. Australia has joined the Netherlands and other G7 countries in uh, now becoming a member of this climate club that's mm. been uh, initiated by uh, Germany um, and other countries. Uh, with a very strong focus there on critical minerals, but also green hydrogen. Mm. Um, what do you make of these initiatives? This, is this just part and parcel of what um, we all need to do now in order to accelerate um, our focus on carbon neutrality and trying to get to a kind mm. of post-carbon world? Mm. I, I think we read day after day um, messages, information, pieces of, of, of news that that's really put, confront us with, with the, the seriousness of, of uh, climate uh, change and, and how uh, everywhere in the world we see different uh, weather patterns. So it's, it's, it's very much in our interest, in our collective interest, uh, to take actions in as many different sectors as uh, is, is possible. Mm. Uh, maybe not always knowing what the uh, achievement will be, but I think we cannot we cannot afford to not try in each and every area where uh, emissions are an important factor to try to come up with new solutions to try to decarbonize as quickly as possible. Um, and the Netherlands very much wants to be part of that solution-oriented approach mm. rather than uh, wait for others to take action and only then, as, as a follower, uh, become part of the solution. Mm. One of the most significant challenges to face Europe in recent years has been the migration mm. crisis. Mm. Certainly since 2015, you know, you've had this veritable explosion mm. in enforced migration, asylum seekers, mm. Um, and on and on. From the standpoint of, of 
of the Netherlands and in terms of your commitment, involvement with the EU, because obviously we've seen these, you know, policy initiatives like global compacts uh, as a way forward. But there are also, of course, many other pressures now. Um, Australians have been reading about issues of, um, you know, housing affordability mm -hmm. in the mm -hmm. Netherlands and so on. So none of this, you know, none of it's straightforward. It's mm -hmm. complex and it's very contradictory. Can you tell us a little bit about how that debate's unfolding in the in the Netherlands and what the response has been there to these challenges? Whatever solution uh, is going to prevail, it's it's clear that as the Netherlands we cannot come up with the solutions on our own. This is very much mm. an issue for Europe, uh, the European Union at large. There simply is a limited absorption capacity in, in very practical terms, mm. uh, regardless of whether, say, from a legal perspective um, uh, asylum uh, should uh, be uh, provided. There are also just very practical circumstances that make it increasingly more difficult to uh, provide that type of um, housing, settlement, etc. to these groups. Um, so any solution that the Netherlands will come up with will be in sync with solutions that are um, uh, found within the broader context of Europe. Could we just remain with, you know, the big global challenges, the global picture for a moment? Um, clearly, Australia has worked very well with the Netherlands um, in terms of regional, bilateral and multilateral cooperation mm -hmm. over many years. Mm -hmm. Some critics have been arguing of late that you know, in these early decades of the 21st century, the world may well be at some kind of tipping point mm. in terms of the kinds of global cosmopolitanism that the European Union, um, with its focus on an in international rules-based order, has been committed to. So these critics have been suggesting what we're increasingly now starting to see are the sort of various fractures and shifts away from sort of multilateral political solutions to unilateral um, political developments. I just wonder, I mean, obviously in terms of the Netherlands, I'm always immediately struck by the fact, you know, it's the home of the International Criminal Court and it's mm -hmm. the home of the International Court of Justice. Mm -hmm. So I think Australians value so much what they can learn from the Netherlands in, in terms of its commitment to an international rules-based order. What, what's your perspective on some of these current arguments and where you think we might be at the moment? Um, and, you know, how both the Netherlands and Australia, mm. but also the EU, um, seeks to confront these massive, massive challenges in our yeah. own time. Uh, I believe that we have to continue to fight for this rules-based uh, order. Uh, challenges are increasing. Um, credibility of certain approaches that we tried in the past um, is questioned by uh, certain actors in, in, in the world. So whatever worked in the past is not necessarily a given for the future. But unless, unless we have a clear rules book whereby everyone is supposed to play, where do we end up? Mm. So I, I think the Netherlands and Australia are very much uh, partnering in uh, standing up for a strong rules-based order, multilateralism, um, making sure that um, the the rules are obeyed, uh, which obviously also calls for um, making sure that we're not seen to apply double standards, which in the current situation is, is something that is, is very challenging. Um, at the same time, given these very important challenges that we are all confronted with, increasingly we have to look for partners that perhaps were not in the past part of our group of friends, but depending on the issue, we have to um, differentiate between partners that can, uh, at which, um, with whom we can find solutions for, for issues at hand. So I think we will see, apart from the continuation of, of say, the global structures, we will uh, increasingly also see uh, alliances that uh, are more regionally uh, orientated but uh, and, and maybe different in composition but that do uh, give us a solution for solving certain issues um, so 
the world becomes more differentiated. Um, mm. But um, the, the point of departure for the Netherlands, and I believe also for Australia, remains that unless we have a clear uh, playbook um, that is relevant for all of us and that we're all committed to, it, uh, it will be very difficult to find solutions for uh, all these pressing issues. Ambassador, moving from the global to the local, can I ask you about the embassy, the work that you do in Canberra and the work that you and your team do with Dutch communities across Australia? Uh, maybe first important to point out that the structure is, is twofold. We have a consul general in Sydney and a team here in, in Canberra. Sydney is more focused on economic activities and uh, consular uh, issues and Canberra is more focused on, say, uh, political or um, security re related issues, but also cultural collaboration. Um, when it comes to the Dutch community, um, one thing that I find relevant is, is to understand that they can help us build bridges. They have been in the country for a long time, so I, I very much see them as eyes and ears on the ground to help me understand um, what are the different issues in the different parts of Australia. So when I make a visit to uh, a state, I, I also try to include a component uh, of meeting with representatives of the Dutch community. Um, given the um, historical footprint that we have in this country, um, cultural heritage uh, collaboration is, is very important. Um, increasingly, we also try to not just put forward a perspective from the Dutch side when it comes, for instance, to shipwrecks that have been found and, and the history behind uh, what has happened, um, not just from, from the people on the, on the ship from the Netherlands uh, or, uh, say, uh, Europeans who settled here and their interaction, but increasingly also providing the perspective from First Nations people. Um, right. So uh, through oral history, research, etc. So within that, honorary consuls across Australia, across the states? We have five honorary consuls uh, within Australia and uh, I'm incredibly uh, fortunate, I feel, with uh, the network that we have. Uh, all five very committed, um, spending a lot of time and efforts outside their professional uh, activities to support uh, the embassy. So far, I've had the pleasure to meet with uh, two of them uh, when I visited Western Australia and South Australia. They have an incredible network. Um, they feel what is uh, making these different states uh, tick. Uh, they uh, support us when we in very practical ways when, when we visit, um, making the right connections, uh, etc. So um, this is a very important extension of, of, of the professional team in mm. uh, Sydney and here in Canberra. Mm. Um, and many of them somehow have a link with the Netherlands, um, Dutch heritage or, or even still uh, Dutch passport uh, holders. Um, and uh, other than community members themselves, they really are in a very practical sense, the ones who build bridges and, and uh, look out for us also when it comes to economic uh, opportunities. So, uh, yeah, very pleased with the network that we have. Ambassador, what can you tell me about the embassy's uh, engagement with the Pacific Islands? It's important to know that uh, in response to changes in the geopolitical um, context, we feel that it's also important not just to engage more strongly with Australia but also with the region at large with Pacific Island states and therefore we also have an extension an expansion I should say within the team with a, a colleague who is now um, more or less dedicated to um, follow and monitor developments within the Pacific region uh, we do this together with colleagues in Manila and Wellington so there are three embassies involved in strengthening what we call our Pacific uh, engagement um, here in Canberra, we're responsible for Nauru, Papua New Guinea, uh, Solomon Islands and Vanuatu. Um, we're still looking for concrete entry points to uh, make that engagement tangible, because it's one thing to just talk about we want to be more engaged, but then you also have mm. to back that up with concrete mm. actions. Uh, one way uh, in which we try to uh, really 
show our genuine interest is uh, by positioning ourselves uh, as a country that has relevant knowledge when it comes to climate adaptation, a country that has been struggling against water for many, many centuries, <laughs> has built up some experience that we hope could also be relevant for some of the island states. So it's that dialogue that we're having to understand um, better where we could be of assistance uh, bilaterally, but also in uh, accessing support that multilateral institutions uh, could provide. We understand that for many of the Pacific Island states, it's, it's rather difficult to uh, access institutions like uh, climate funds. Um, we perhaps could uh, be a bridge in, in uh, amplifying voices in uh, enhancing understanding of what could work for uh, island states um, because I think it's it's very important to note that uh, absorption capacity, administrative absorption capacity is limited. So we have to be very careful not to overburden these systems with bureaucracy. That's simply not going to help to find the, the real solutions for the issues at hand. So if I ask you to look through your ambassadorial you know, crystal ball out to say the next 20 or 30 years, what would you like to see happen in terms of the dynamic and the interaction between our two countries? I'm not sure whether I would dare to look that far into the future. Let's stick to the four years that I'm here uh, responsible for the team in, in Australia. Uh, it would be my ambition that from both sides we have a genuine and um, realistic understanding of how we can complement uh, one another. Uh, I recently spoke with a colleague within DFAT who had been part of the Australian Embassy team in, uh, in The Hague. And, um, maybe slightly biased because of her time in, in, uh, in the Netherlands, but in, in any case she felt that Australia perhaps had not yet a full appreciation of where as countries we are like-minded and can do more together. Mm -hmm. So for me it would be a great success if I manage to give that portrayal of what the Netherlands could mean for Australia where we could be of relevance and, and, and obviously we are very keen to also get that even further realistic picture of what Australia could mean for the Netherlands. And by that, um, elevate the relationship to uh, an high, a higher level, a more strategic uh, level, um, as middle powers with very like-minded uh, outlooks on the situation in the world. Uh, I think there's more to be done together. Well, we wish you luck with that work. And Ambassador Stolzbracher, thank you very much for joining us on Europe Now. It was my pleasure. Thank you.